So our next speaker is Dr. Andre Holder. He's one of the our ER and critical care physicians here at Grady. He'll be speaking to us about an update on the surviving sepsis campaign and the guidelines in the post-EGD era. Morning, everyone. Again, thank you very much to Micah and to um, the organizers of this, uh, of this conference for inviting me to speak about this. Uh, so again, today I'm going to talk about the surviving sepsis campaign and, and updates uh, over the past few years since its last publication. Um, so first off, uh, I'd like to first say that I have no disclosures to submit. Um, and a couple of, uh, of uh, warnings I want to give before I actually give this talk. So some of the slides might have changed from the iteration that you have uh, in, in your packets, so just bear with me. And also, you'll notice that I'll be using the uh, prior definitions um, simply because that's the data that we had available for, for the, the prior iteration of surviving sepsis. So uh, as an overview, uh, again, just going to review uh, the, the most recent uh, edition of the surviving sepsis campaign that came out four years ago. Uh, just the big highlight points. Uh, and we're going to talk about what's new since uh, four years ago in the literature. Uh, specifically, talking about sepsis care uh, since uh, the three or so trials that have come out um, refuting early goal directed therapy in contemporary practice. Uh, and also, we'll touch a little bit on uh, how uh, surviving sepsis, uh, how sepsis three, rather, the new definitions uh, and clinical criteria that, that were just discussed uh, affect sepsis care as it pertains to surviving sepsis. And then we'll go over some take-home points. So uh, I'm going to talk about the different uh, broad strokes, uh, items about that surviving sepsis goes over in three broad categories. So the first has to do with initial resuscitation and uh, infection control. So uh, the use, first off, of a routine screening uh, for sepsis and per for, performance, for performance improvement, uh, one of them being a lactate. Uh, it submits that we need to have cultures and proof of an infection, all things that we all routinely do in current practice. Antibiotics early, of course. Um, trying to obtain source control if there is an additional source, if there's a pocket of pus, for instance, that needs to be drained as early as possible. And uh, some form of protocolized quantitative resuscitation. And what's been sort of the crowning jewel, if you will, of, of surviving sepsis has been early goal-directed therapy. Uh, and again, we'll talk about how that's changed. So the second category I'm going to talk about is hemodynamic support. So uh, preferred fluids, of course, I'm sure we all give it, crystalloids. Uh, the, they recommend against using hydroxyethyl uh, starch solutions. The initial vasopressor of choice, as we all know, is levofed or norepinephrine. Uh, vasopressin can be used as an adjunct in addition to, uh, to levofed, but not as a single agent. Epinephrine can be used as a second line or third line if we give vasopressin in addition to levofed. And dopamine can be an alternative to levofed in uh, specific situations. In those patients who have myocardial dysfunction, and it, uh, as, as a consequence of their sepsis, providing inotropes for that, or if they have end organ hypoperfusion evidence um, after all the first steps have been taken. And then, of course, uh, the role, or probably lack of role, of, um, of IV hydrocortisone stress dose therapy. The only exception to that um, that they caveat is in patients who are both fluid and vasopressor refractory. And then the third category is going to be other supportive care measures that we can provide to septic patients. So for instance, um, keeping the hemoglobin goal about seven to nine. Uh, providing blood products only if bleeding, with the exception of if their, their platelet count is below 10. If patients that are septic end up developing ARDS, uh, then all the things that we would normally do for patients with ARDS, so low tide of volume ventilation, conservative fluid management as appropriate, um, early paralysis, and early proning. Minimizing the amount of sedation with the literature that's out there on that associated association with poor outcomes and mortality. Um, some form of protocolized glucose control, uh, specifically a more liberal approach, uh, as indicated in the NICE sugar trial based on uh, blood glucose of less than 180. Um, and they also caution against point of care glucose testing and some inaccuracies that have been found in the literature with that. And uh, bicarbonate therapy being reserved really for those patients who have hemodynamic instability in the setting of profound acidosis. And of course, early uh, nutrition as early as possible. So um, since that time, there have been studies that have actually reinforced a lot of the, the, the different recommendations that uh, I've already gone over. So for instance, uh, the literature suggesting the crystalloids are probably the preferred, the preferred agent in that giving in the Albios trial, giving albumin uh, to patients who have severe sepsis or septic shock did not really change mortality in comparison to those who received crystalloid. Uh, 
uh, with respect to uh, our, our, our hemoglobin goals for these patients, again, a lower versus higher hemoglobin threshold, lower being in this study seven to nine and above nine being higher uh, in this being the TRIST trial, uh, no evidence of, 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 of uh, difference in mortality, ischemic events, or life support. So with respect to prone positioning, again, early prone positioning in those patients who develop ARDS, again, a significant decrease in mortality uh, if done early. And then, of course, uh, the surviving sepsis campaign bundles that were introduced, which I'll go over in a little bit later on, but the fact that uh, when people are most compliant, the more compliant you are, basically, the better the, mor the, better the mortality. Now, then there are those studies that have actually um, put some of the things that we've been in practice to question. So there's uh, what I call the trifecta. Um, these studies here, uh, the process study, the ARISE study, and, um, and uh, PROMISE, that have called, again, called into question the role of early goal-directed therapy in today's practice. And then uh, there's this study that came out, the sepsis spam trial, uh, looking at blood pressure targets. So we'll talk a little bit more about this. Now, uh, before we go into that, though, let's just talk about early goal-directed therapy and some of the things that have come up in the literature over the years that uh, sort of brought these, these uh, different trials that I spoke about to bear. So first off, for those of you who are not familiar with early goal-directed therapy, I highly doubt that that's the case. But uh, just to review this a little bit, so again, this was a, a, a protocolized system to deal with the hemodynamic management, specifically the hemodynamic management of patients with sepsis. This is assuming, of course, that they're getting the appropriate antibiotics and uh, being treated otherwise uh, as best as possible. Now, again, there's, they're going over specific goals that we've set for different uh, uh, aberrancies in hemodynamic management um, that, that are, are highlighted here. So, CVP being a, a surrogate for whether or not someone is, is uh, adequately fluid responsive or, or adequately fluid resuscitated, excuse me. Uh, a MAP goal, of course, to maintain adequate perfusion. And then the idea of the central venous oxygen saturation to, as a surrogate for tissue extraction. So, uh, and then of course, these, uh, hem this, in, the, in this case, case, hematocrit target and also the introduction of inotropes. So over the years, since this study was published in 2001, many of these things have been called into question. So for instance, uh, the role of CVP as a measure of volume responsiveness, there's been literature that's coming out time and time again, and a couple of meta-analyses that focused on that, that show that CVP is not a useful tool for assessing volume responsiveness. What's, what about the role of the central venous oxygen saturation? Um, both of these, by the way, require a central line. Do we really need that? So this study... Uh, that came out six years ago in JAMA uh, looked at giving, looking at lactate clearance. So in other words, measuring the lactate, doing what you'd normally do for patients with sepsis that have hemodynamic issues, and remeasuring the lactate and seeing if there's a decrease. So when this was done, it turns out that this was equally as, as good um, at, determining, at, uh, at, at, at uh, determining outcomes as the SCVO2. Now, this idea of the hematocrit greater than 30, well, even before the TRIST trial that I mentioned uh, in the prior slide, there was the TRIC trial that came out in 1999, um, which talked about, again, uh, a more liberal uh, or lower hemoglobin threshold as opposed to hematocrit of 30, which essentially corresponds to a hemoglobin of about 10. So given that, these studies came into being uh, to assess the utility of early goal-directed therapy in contemporary practice. So this being the process trial from my fellowship alma mater in Pittsburgh, looking at a US-based study, the ARISE trial, which was focused in Australia uh, and in Asia, and the PROMISE trial, which is centered in the UK. So even though all of these studies have different sort of niches that they try to answer, or niche questions, I should say, that they try to answer, they all come up to the same conclusion, in that in today's practice, and again, I focus on that, initial resuscitation with early goal-directed therapy or a similar protocol did not, have an, did not uh, decrease 60 or 90 day mortality over usual care. So what does that mean for us? So does that mean that we should throw the baby out with the bathwater? In other words, are there certain things that, certain important lessons that we probably should take from the whole early goal-directed therapy phenomenon and paradigm that can translate to today's practice. And I submit to you, and probably I'll speak for the rest of the surviving sepsis campaign, um, would submit to you that uh, there is 
indeed some utility in some of the lessons that we learned from early goal-directed therapy. So first off, um, what are the differences at that time, 15 years ago, to today? Well, we know that mortality has steadily been decreasing in our septic patients consistently. Um, this is a study looking at 12 years, the, from 20, 2000 to 2012. Around the time that that study was published, uh, you could see here that the mortality was about 35%. As of four years ago, it was somewhere in the order of 18%. So again, there's potentially something different about the patients that we're treating now compared to then. Well, the question is, is our care better than it was a few years ago? Probably. Um, so this is a study that looks at the uh, comparing the different, the different trials that looked at early goal-directed therapy. So the original Rivers study done in 2001 and the three studies that I mentioned before. So if you notice, um, the amount of fluid that's being given to the patients at that time was much higher. And also on top of that, the amount of fluids that was given to the early goal-directed therapy group was about a liter and a half. Um, so potentially clinically significant. If you look at the amount of fluids that's given to uh, these, in, in the more recent studies, excuse me, it's about the same across the control and, compar and the, uh, the intervention groups. So the answer to that question is probably our care is, is, is better. Um, perhaps we're identifying, not perhaps, but more likely we're identifying people earlier and resuscitating them earlier than they would have uh, even in the control arm of that study 15 years ago. Now, looking a little bit deeper, a different uh, comparison, looking at the how severe these patients, how severely sick these patients were. If you look at the River study, their lactates were on the order of six to seven, and whereas in the more recent studies it was around four, which corresponded to mortalities in the control groups for for early goal directed therapy. The River study of about forty four percent compared to. Uh, around the, the high teens, low 20s for the more recent studies. So in other words, something is, has changed about our care. Uh, and it's not necessarily fair to compare care at that time compared to, uh, to care in, in today's care. So um, again, is there anything that we can extract from early goal-directed therapy, any lessons that we can learn that could apply here? So the key to that is I think we probably need to take the early out of the early goal-directed therapy and apply that. So early recognition, early antibiotics and source control, early fluid resuscitation and hemodynamic support, and then of course reassessing once you've met your targets. Now, um, because of the fact that we're taking these lessons out, of course the Surviving Sepsis campaign, even though there's not yet been a formal, um, a formal full set of, uh, of, of recommendations that have been submitted yet, they've made addenda to the prior iteration. So, Whereas before, the focus was on these specific parameters that early goal-directed therapy derived for us. Now, sort of the, the, the world is our oyster, if you will. There's a sea of different uh, ways that we can reassess and assess whether or not patients have actually hit targets that we set. And we don't necessarily have to subscribe to the ones that were outlined in, in the original study. So... Um, is there, one can argue, is there really any utility in any goal-directed approach? Because again, the control arms for all these recent studies was just usual care. Do what you would normally do under normal circumstances. So perhaps we just need better targets. Maybe it's not CVP and SVO2 uh, and, and, uh, and looking at a hemoglobin of, of, uh, of greater than 30, or hematocrit, excuse me, greater than 30. Perhaps we need better targets to target, and maybe that might actually improve um, and reintroduce the role for protocolized care. So then there's the other side to this. So how come we're not individualizing care for our patients? And this question came up with the sepsis BAM trial. So this specific study asked the question, does, blood pressure, does the blood pressure target in septic shock affect patient outcome? So as opposed to the one size fits all that we usually see in the unit where everyone gets a MAP goal of 65 to 70, this study specifically asked, well, what if we set a higher MAP goal? Um, would that affect mortality and also uh, organ dysfunction? So the conclusion from that is that there was no mortality difference. There was, of course, more atrial fibrillation because you're giving them more vasopressors to meet that target of 80 to 85. But interestingly enough, in a 
and take this, take this to heart, a subgroup analysis, um, there was a lower need for renal, renal replacement therapy, i.e. CVVH or dialysis, among patients with chronic hypertension. Now, of course, this makes sense, right? If patients are used to living at a higher blood pressure, then perhaps we should be targeting a higher blood pressure to preserve organ function. So the take home here really is that Excuse me, we should think about higher blood pressure targets uh, in our chronically hypertensive patients to prevent, potentially prevent organ dysfunction. Again, just subscribing to that, look, maybe not a one size fits all for every patient. So, of course, there are some other studies that have come out that I'd say would be honorable mentions. Uh, many of them have to do with these other parameters that we might be able to use as targets for our, our resuscitation. A couple of these are meta-analyses, so looking at pulse pressure variation, um, showing that it, it might be useful. Passive leg raise, for instance, uh, and, and some sur surrogate or measure of cardiac output in assessing whether or not patients are fluid responsive and need more volume. Now, uh, this study, or this review by, uh, by Chris Seymour that published last year, was the first, uh, at least I've seen, to mention pulse contour analysis. So uh, stroke volume variation, very much akin to pulse pressure variation. And again, these are all just... Mark, just tools that we can use to replace the ones that may or may not be very useful um, to adequately resuscitate our patients. Are there new treatment protocols needed, for instance? Again, instead of throwing the, 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 even the bathtub out with the bath order now, um, perhaps protocols do have their place, but we just have the wrong targets. So this is a study uh, that came out in the Blue Journal a few years ago looking specifically at lactate-driven protocols. Uh, this is one that's more um, OR-based, looking at stroke volume variation. Again, a different target. Perhaps this is, the, this is the, the, the direction that we should be going. Now, uh, what are the impacts? I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and just talk about what the impact of um, sepsis 3, the new definitions and clinical criteria that you've heard about, have on surviving sepsis campaign. So in short, very little, um, in part because, again, these are essentially, for the most part, some of them are name changes, right? Certainly the, the, the framework has changed, and it makes us think, think a little bit more about sepsis in the way that we best understand it. But from a practical perspective, it doesn't really change a whole lot of what we do. So, finally, my take-home points. So the surviving sepsis campaign is still crucial, I would argue, to mitigating organ failure and mortality in sepsis. Uh, in the era of early recognition and intervention, perhaps rigid adherence to early goal-directed therapy is not necessary. Um, treatment targets should probably be, be patient-specific, as evidenced from the sepsis fam trial. But again, this tug of war, perhaps maybe there's, there is a role for protocolized care in the future, and we just need to pick the right targets to measure. So with that, I'll take any questions.